Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Face the State. I am Chet Lehman from the Montana Television Network station in the Bozeman area. We are not in Bozeman this morning. However, we're a little bit south of there. Joining me this morning, Cam Shawley, superintendent of Yellowstone National Park. That's actually where we are. We're in the uh, headquarters building here in old Fort Yellowstone, as it were. Cam, thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. Appreciate you being here, Chet. Um, because it was snowing this morning when we came in, didn't have a lot of traffic. Yeah, I think, it, I think that's a good way to deal with it. increased <laughs> visitors is just have uh, Mother Nature uh, have it snow a little bit and uh, takes care of the problem. Uh, for a short period of time, as we know, uh, yeah. numbers here in the park have been strong. Uh, over 4 million for the last several years, showing no signs of letting up. Uh, that's caused some challenges for you folks here in Yellowstone. Let's just uh, yeah. dive into some of that, uh, some of those challenges yeah. that you're dealing with. Well, I mean, I think that uh, it's interesting uh, you know, visitation has increased here in the park uh, substantially. I think one of the more interesting statistics that I've seen has been uh, not only the increase during the summer visitation, our, our winter visitation stayed relatively the same. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that represents about 6% of our total visitation in the winter months, but the summer months uh, have gone up substantially, especially since 2000. I mean, you can see a couple hundred thousand more visitors in the months of July, August, uh, now than you could in 2000. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's a big impact. I think the biggest um, surprise to me is probably the increase in September. Mm -hmm. In 2000, we're up about 370,000 visitors in the month of September, uh, or people coming in the month of September now than we were in 2000. Mm -hmm. And so that, that's substantial. And you know, I think we, as we hit 4 million visitors around 2015 for the first time, you know, um, We've kind of plateaued, we got up to about 4.2, and we've kind of been down about 4.1 in mm -hmm. that range. Mm -hmm. um, I think that trajectory will continue to go up. I don't know if it'll go up as aggressively as it did in the last five years, mm -hmm. but that trend will continue to move upwards, and we've got to be ready for that. Uh, in reality, you've been in the park for a long time. This is not your first time here. You yeah. spent a lot of time here as a young man. Yep. Um, it's changed. In 30 years that I've been working in this, it's changed a lot. Uh, whereas the Norris Geyser Basin, for example, when I first came, that was my favorite place to go because I knew yeah. I'd find a place to park. Hardly any everybody went there. Now we have these things called overflow parking out on the yeah. main road. <clears throat> that, that poses more challenges for you folks. Yeah, and I, I think just kind of stepping back, and your point mm -hmm. about Norris is interesting because when I was here um, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. uh, Norris was not busy at all, mm -hmm. to your point. Now it's one of the busiest parts of the park mm -hmm. for, for a variety of different reasons. But um, when, you know, my predecessor, Dan Wank, uh, did a very good job of talking about, uh, you know, humans being the least studied species in the park. Mm -hmm. And what are the impacts of increased visitation on different aspects of this park that we need to be concerned about. Mm -hmm. So we'll talk a little bit about uh, what some of the visitors are saying from a, from a very large uh, survey we did last summer mm -hmm. uh, that I really appreciate Dan and the team here getting, getting going because it's very informative as far as the actions that we need to take and be mm -hmm. prepared for in the future. But what we've tried to do is put some form around visitation here and how we manage and mm -hmm. what, what the true impacts of increased visitors are on this park. Mm -hmm. And there's a narrative out there, um, and has been, that the visitors in Yellowstone are overrunning the park, um, severely degrading the condition of the resources. And it's important that we kind of, like I said, separate fact from fiction on mm -hmm. some of those narratives. And mm -hmm. so what we've done is to tr try to develop a, a foundational strategy that focuses on kind of four areas. One is, what are the impacts of increased visitation on the resources of this park? Mm -hmm. um, where, where are impacts happening? What are the things that we need to do to mitigate, prevent, eliminate uh, impacts to the resources? Mm -hmm. That's one. Two is, what are the impacts on our staff, on our infrastructure, on our operations? You know, you, you put a million more people on this park in four or five years, that is a huge impact on things that some people don't think about, like wastewater treatment facilities, mm. um, the, the, the number of people it takes to manage visitors. Uh, so what are, those, what are those impacts? That's two. And three, what are the impacts on the visitors themselves? What do they think? And what we found is many times what we think they think is different than what they actually think. And so that survey data has really come in uh, handy from the mm -hmm. standpoint of us understanding what the visitors are experiencing and where there's problems in the park that we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And then fourth, lastly, 
uh, but very importantly is what are the impacts of increased visitation on the gateways. Mm -hmm. uh, economically, uh, the traffic congestion that they're seeing, uh, there's more impacts on their infrastructure. And so those are the four kind of compartments that we're really focused on mm -hmm. and that we can talk about a little bit this morning. You, you touched on one that I want to get into a little bit is the impact on the on the visitor mm -hmm. as they were looking at that. I think it, it, it depends on, from what I understand, what visitor you're talking to. Right. You're talking to the local who's been coming to the park like you and I have been for 30 years. Our impact is different than it is for that person who's first time visit is here right. and they've been making their plans for years to come into the park. A am I oversimplifying that? But it it's a it's a different perspective when we think, oh gosh, I had to wait for so long or I had to find a parking spot or something along those lines. For those of us who've been doing this for a long time, it's different than those people who are maybe coming for the first time or haven't been here in, in a long, long time. Yeah, that's, that's, that's well said. I mean, 70% or more of our visitors were first time visitors last year. Mm -hmm. And Yellowstone's a bucket list trip for people. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those people have never seen a bison in the wild. They've never seen a grizzly. Mm -hmm. and, and when they do, they're gonna stop their car. They're gonna get out. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily their fault. The park service hasn't built shoulders on the side of the road for them to pull right. over. I, had, I, tell, I tell a story regularly. Uh, I had a, a gentleman in West Yellowstone tell me that it used to take him a half an hour to get to his favorite fishing spot on the Madison. Mm -hmm. Now it takes him an hour regularly. Mm -hmm. And if, if I want his support as a superintendent, I better get it back down to 30 minutes. Right. And what's interesting about that, to your point, is he's seen a thousand bison. He's seen grizzlies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when that traffic jam occurs, uh, you know, on, on the road, the corridor between West and Old Faithful or wherever, um, the people that are out seeing those things for the first time, they're on their roofs, they're pulled over, they're excited, they're enjoying that moment. Mm -hmm. He's 30 cars back trying to get to his fishing spot in 30 minutes. He's not enjoying that moment too much. And so really, you know, reconciling those forms of enjoyment while protecting these resources is what visitor use management is all about. Mm -hmm. And in those four areas that we talk about, I, I, I look at a spectrum. When I, got, when I came here, I got asked a lot of questions about are we going to implement visitation caps and reservation systems. Mm -hmm. The reality is we're not ready to have that conversation yet. Mm -hmm. And to some people who've, who, you know, believe that's the way to go, what I would suggest is that a spectrum of of action from doing nothing mm -hmm. to aggressively managing visitors like a visitation cap or, or reservation system. We need to make sure that we're taking the right actions in the right sequence uh, that are having the biggest impacts in the areas where we're seeing mm -hmm. there, there being issues. Uh, and a lot of times that's something simple and not necessarily something super complex. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest in this park, even though the team here has done a phenomenal job in a variety of areas, we're getting more organized in relationship to understanding that some of these actions here can have really big impacts on improving visitor experience, congestion, um, reducing impacts to resources and that kind of thing. And we don't necessarily need to go to the extreme. Do we need to think about that for the future? Yeah, we need to be strategic. And if, if you know, we're talking seven or eight million visitors in Yellowstone at some point, I don't, I don't know what the number is exactly. Mm -hmm. Those actions need to become more aggressive. Um, but I, I, I do think, and I'll give you an example. Uh, if you've been to the Madison intersection, the junction there, it's a three-way mm -hmm. uh, intersection. For years, that's been a three-way intersection, but a one-way stop. So the only, the only traffic that had to stop was the traffic coming from West Yellowstone. Mm -hmm. The other traffic had moved north and south. And uh, at one point, I think last year, uh, traffic backed up two miles. And as we talked to the team on the ground there, they were saying, hey, can you just make it a three-way stop? Mm -hmm. And we had transportation studies, uh, traffic studies that suggested we need to put a roundabout in, mm -hmm. even one that said put a flyover in. Mm -hmm. And we decided to put three stop signs up. Mm -hmm. And it largely fixed the problem this summer. I mean, we had very limited backups in that intersection. Mm -hmm. And even though that's a simplistic action, it's something that we took that really solved the problem. It didn't cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's an example of, you know, Norris, for instance, we did a pilot where we put um, a crew in the, in the parking lot and then one at the intersection. We developed some overflow parking because once you pulled in there, mm -hmm. uh, you were in gridlock a lot of times and it took you forever to get out. Mm -hmm. And it's simple things of, Hey, the traffic, the parking lot's full, um, have people start parking in the overflow. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we got a lot of lessons learned there, a lot of improvement from how we manage the experience in Norris. 
and then looking around the park at where we need to do that uh, and make sure that we're taking our staffing, is, our resources are allocated properly in the right places is really what we're focused on as well. Well, the, the four million people that are coming pretty consistently now, it, it, it wasn't like 10 years ago it was 200,000. This has been a gradual increase. Yeah. I, it sounds to me like you're looking at, you're not just going to go to the extreme to fix any of these problems. That's not, it didn't extremely start that way. It isn't gonna extremely end that way either. Right. You're going to deal with some of that. Th some of the challenges though you're dealing with it, Yellowstone would be a lot easier if it wasn't so diverse. I mean, you talk to 10 people who come through the gates and you maybe have 10 different reasons why they're coming through. Mm -hmm. One of the guys is delivering towels. One of the people is going to his favorite fishing spot. Two people are looking for bears. One are heading to Old Faithful. And you, I mean, the wow. list goes, you're too diverse, Cam. You make it too hard on us. <laughs> that, I mean, I think that's, that's the beautiful thing about Yellowstone, yeah. but that every person in that vehicle, you those 10 lines of cars, they all have a different perspective of where they're going when they enter the gate at Mammoth and you know head out to wherever it is they're going in the park. That's a challenge. It is, and, you know, 3,500 square mile park, mm -hmm. 300 plus miles of road. Mm -hmm. um, that road corridor makes up about 1% of the park. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I can't remember the exact stat, but it's like 95% of the people never get more than a half mile away from their car. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the vast majority of the park doesn't, never sees a visitor. Mm -hmm. um, but we have some substantial issues in that road corridor. And the question is, are we taking the right actions? Uh, what people's perceptions are, which are accurate, is that it's become busier and busier, but it is still within that confined percentage of the park that uh, people are traveling on. And even, you know, as I mentioned before we started here, you know, I was in the backcountry uh, last month in one of the most remote parts of the park. I hiked 20 miles, didn't see one person. Mm -hmm. Um, but you go to Norris and you see, or, or Midway Geyser Basin, or the Geyser Corridor, and, it, and it's busy. Mm -hmm. And but it's not, you know, where, when it's really busy in the Geyser Corridor, it doesn't always mean that it's really busy in Lamar. I mean, it can be, mm -hmm. but there are parts of the park, even in the road corridor, that are not as busy as others. And are we focused in those areas that are, um, you know, the busiest and having the highest impacts on staff and, and resources and things like that? Some of the infrastructure is a challenge, though. I'm looking out the window right now, and it's snowing. Uh, makes road construction very difficult. As, there is no road construction in Yellowstone in January. Right. Some other places can do that. You don't have that luxury, and you're putting primarily of those four million people, I, the, the vast majority of them are in those summer months when it's a really nice time to fix the roads or, wow. or build overflow parking and things like that. That challenge in itself makes this, I think maybe that's where some of the frustration might come from some of the tours. Do you see, you, I mean, I know you know that, you're yeah. dealing with it, but is that a fair read on some of this as well? Yeah, it is, and I, I think as we work to, we've had a lot of projects going on in this park. I think we've got about $100 million worth of construction projects lined up next year. Hmm. Um, you know, a lot of that infrastructure is aging, bridges and roads, and it, it takes a long time. We have short windows. That means a lot of times those contracts have to run over multiple summers. I know it's frustrating, um, but we're making some substantial improvements, and we're trying to do everything we can to both accomplish what we need to from an infrastructure improvement standpoint, but also um, impact the visitors and our partners as, as, as least as possible. You mentioned it before we started this, you had gone into the backcountry and spent some time there. The one thing that I know you're working on for Yellowstone is making sure that it doesn't change. Your experience in the backcountry has been that way. When I get to wherever it is I'm going, whether it's Norris Geyser Basin or Old Faithful or Midway Geyser, wherever it is I, my destination happens to be that I'm on my visit, that's the beautiful thing so far. We're not impacting that. I'm still seeing bison. I'm still seeing right. bears. I'm still seeing all of that. I know that's a primary focus on all that as well. The resources are, whether another human being ever comes here or not, the resources have to stay. Absolutely. And, um, I, you know, I, I think that uh, this part never fails to deliver. Mm -hmm. I mean, the visitor satisfaction rates are very, very high. Mm -hmm. I'll get to some of the statistics from the survey here in a minute. But, um, you know, one of the primary reasons people come here is to see wildlife. They're seeing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's our job to manage that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's become more challenging. I mean, mm -hmm. this park has lost about seven and a half million dollars in buying power since 2010. Mm -hmm. um, so our staffing, you know, we supplement that with fees and things like that. Uh, but we've got the same staff or less now than we did in 2010, but we're managing a lot more. Mm -hmm. And so being more strategic with what we have, understanding where those gaps exist, and there's trade-offs. You know, what are those service levels? What does the American public want to see from a service level standpoint mm -hmm. in this park? And I think there's a good conversation to have about how do we ensure that we balance 
um, the proper service levels in this park, whether that's the staff that incredible, and the, you know, I've said this before to you, mm -hmm. that the team here is one of the best I've ever worked with. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a tipping point there where, you know, when I see uh, rangers working, you know, 18 hours a day, um, you know, we don't have the right resources in the right places to manage visitor expectations or protect the resources, then there are adjustments that need to be made. Um, and we need to focus that on the future. Mm. What, do, what does the American public, not only for Yellowstone, but for this entire system, uh, want to um, entertain from the standpoint of the revenues that are needed to improve and manage these parks? And the way we, and the way we do that, I think, has got to be discussed moving forward. Let's talk about some of those stats yeah. that you found. Has the visitor to Yellowstone changed, do you think? I mean, you, you, you have a unique experience here because you've been here for a long time in a different way. You lived here. Yeah. You, you had a chance to experience Yellowstone unlike a lot of us, and now you're back here. You've been somewhere else, and now you're back into a place where you, <clears throat> where you, you grew up. Uh, do you think the visitor has changed? I mean, technology has certainly changed him. Packing around one of these things, mm -hmm. I can get a... I can be the National Geographic photographer of those elk that are wandering around right. outside your building right now. That poses a challenge for you yeah. and some of your staff. Well, yeah, and I, I think, you know, you see the petting of the bison, or we had mm -hmm. someone fall into one of the geysers mm -hmm. there uh, a couple of days ago. Um, that gets a lot more attention now than it did 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, um, you know, I, I clearly in a 30-year period, um, and I've been here almost a year next month, which mm -hmm. is, or this month, which is time goes by so quick. Right. Um, but as I said, I, I, the one thing that I do clearly see a difference in is the, the visitation, the increased visitation in the shoulder seasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, it used to be Labor Day. Um, mm -hmm. You'd have some people here for the rut in right. September, but generally visitation just fell off. Um, now, uh, you know, last weekend or a couple weekends ago, I would say that uh, there was a Saturday that was as busy as a Saturday in July or, or June. And mm -hmm. so a lot of that visitation not only is increasing in the summer, but it's being pushed into May and September. And, you know, 500 of our, our workforce are seasonals. So mm -hmm. they're here for mo several months out of a year. Right. And so when you start seeing visitation get pushed into the shoulder seasons, you don't necessarily have the advantage that you have in the summer of a full staff, per se. So that puts even more of a, a weight and a demand on the permanent employees that are here. So we got to monitor that as well. True. So, uh, some of that, though, is, I mean, it, it's a good, bad thing. Some of that, I would think, is becoming... This contract several years ago that Yellowstone went into long term with Zantera, the mm -hmm. twenty year project, which required them to do a bunch of infrastructure work. Yeah, um, y you can stay in some of these buildings now in September. It used to be a little chilly to stay at Mammoth Hotel or or Lake or some of those facilities where you couldn't stay in some of those shoulder seasons because the building wasn't quite right. you know the luxury place that it was. Well, these are energy efficient, wonderful buildings now and. A stay in September feels just like a stay in July because the temperature is controlled. Well, and you, you were at the Mammoth Hotel event. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, a I think, probably the best accommodations in the entire park service right now. Yeah. Uh, great investment. Mm -hmm. uh, they did a fantastic job, as you saw, mm -hmm. uh, protecting the historic fabric of that building, but, mo but building it also with modern energy efficiency and mm -hmm. comfort. And I think, I think they stru struck a good balance. And you know, the, the point about the concessioners, I mean, they do a fantastic job. I mean, Zantera's made some substantial improvements, as mm has -hmm. Delaware North and others. Um, and it's all about partnership. The park service can't do that stuff alone, so. Yeah, you um, and I've talked about that before. That, yeah. it, without any of that, we're not having this conversation at all, are we? Absolutely not. Yeah. Um, so a couple of, a couple of things. We're gonna release the survey data, but you're seeing it for the first time here. Um, on your question about, are you a first time visitor to the park, almost 70%. Um, how many adults, 18 years and older, are you in your are in your group? 60% um, said two. 14% said three. Uh, so two is is the number. Mm -hmm. uh, so how many children, 18 years or old, are in your group? Um, under 18 years old, 70% uh, said zero. That was that's a surprise to me. Me, me too. 70% so said that they have zero children under 18. 10% um, have one. 10% have two. Wow. Uh, that, that's a surprising statistic for, uh, for me. Um, yeah, I think your, your stat, though, off the top, 70% first-time visitors. Mm -hmm. th that's where some of the conflict comes in, isn't it? it this isn't, you know, some of us are going to, you're in the park all the time. Yeah. I, I've been in the park dozens of times this summer. I, it, <clears throat> the guy going to the fishing hole has probably been in there five or six times. Right. 
completely different perspective. That, that needs to be addressed, I would think. You've got to keep that in mind, that car in front of you. They've never seen this. That, that bush is a brand new bush. Right. Everything is brand new. That's true. And I think there's also a lot we can do and we're doing better as far as helping people plan their trip. Mm. And really basic things. Mm. Like we've got all kinds of studies that show when the parking lots fill up. Mm -hmm. you know, and so to say, hey, don't go to Norris between 10 and 2.30. Mm -hmm. um, try to go before 10 or after 2.30. I mean, basic things that we can help people and help diffuse some of that visitation, some of these busy, busy times of the day or times of the week mm -hmm. um, is, is really important. So how, approximately how many minutes did you and your group have to wait in traffic at the entrance station? Less than five minutes was 80%. Um, how acceptable is the amount of time that you spent waiting in our Yellowstone National Park? 70% said completely acceptable, very acceptable. So we're making a lot of improvements in our entrance stations. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have backups, but generally speaking, um, you know, they're not quite as bad as, as people think. Um, majority of people here said they're here to see the uh, view scenery, uh, to view wildlife, to see geysers and thermal features, to experience a wild place. Um, all the way down to, you know, to experience solitude and to get away from crowds and people. Um, we have, if you looked at the attractions overall, <clears throat> how, how acceptable was the amount of time you spent looking for parking across all attractions in the park? 42% completely acceptable, 26% very acceptable, uh, not acceptable 5.7%. Hmm. Um, how crowded did you feel in Yellowstone today? Extremely crowded 5.6%. Not at all crowded, 22.8, slightly crowded, 28. So, you know, you'll see these in more detail, but I think what it, what it does is, you know, visitors are having a very good time. They have a very high satisfaction rate. What, they, what they've done in there and that there's some really good micro data in specific sites that we can use from where the bathrooms are the dirtiest that we can put staff and, mm -hmm. and, and get them cleaner. Where are the biggest areas of congestion, which we found are Ferry Falls, Midway Geyser Basin, mm -hmm. Norris, and some of the areas around Canyon. We start looking at how do we alleviate some of those things. We start talking about shuttle systems. We've had conversations about mm -hmm. people wanting to do a park-wide shuttle system. That's probably not viable right now. Mm -hmm. But what is viable is doing some local shuttles running out of um, Old Faithful into the Geyser Basin on a loop or mm -hmm. at the Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone into you know Artist Point, Inspiration Point, things like that. I think mm -hmm. those could get a lot of use. Uh, our survey data uh, you know, with, sh with shuttles say that 80% of the people support them. As long as they don't have to use them, right? Um, so there's a balance in there somewhere. Sure. Uh, but we find that people want to get to home base. I mean, they want to unload their cars, they want to get to park, parking, get checked in, and mm -hmm. then I think if a shuttle's available in some of these areas where we have a high density of accommodations, we'll we'll have we have some options that we're looking at in that in that on that front. And I get asked that question about shuttles all the time. I get asked a lot about why are we not doing what we're doing in Zion. Um, more. Mm -hmm. You know, Zion's much further ahead than we are in this. Mm -hmm. They've had shuttle systems for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the geography in Zion's a lot different. <clears throat> um, you know, Zion's 150,000 acres, gets 4.5 million visitors. We're 2.2 million acres. We get about 4 million visitors. Um, you you so also have another challenge. There's a couple ways into Zion. Yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of ways. You got too right. many entrances. Yeah, exactly. Too many exits. And I think on that point about the gateways, I mean, uh, the conversation. Uh, that you might have in West Yellowstone versus Cook City or Cody. Mm -hmm. Those are different conversations sure. about what communities' concerns are and what they might be willing to do to manage visitation in mm -hmm. one place versus another. And so sure. we're, we're very sensitive to that as well. Well, yeah, you're, you're trying to manage New Hampshire. Yeah. It, it, it makes it a little more challenging. Those numbers, what do those tell you, Ken? I mean, <clears throat> what do you look at? Just the first glance, you looked at those numbers. We're doing okay, but... We need to do this. Uh, well, what did those numbers tell you? So let me go real quick on the resources. The, mm -hmm. the condition of the ecosystem in Yellowstone is stronger than it's been in mm -hmm. over 100 years. Uh, no question. We put a lot of the pieces back together. Our team's doing a phenomenal job. There's areas that we have concerns. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult, though, to correlate increased visitation to direct impacts on the health of species in this park. Mm -hmm. uh, so really uh, for us to focus on understanding where those are occurring, how we can mitigate, like I said, is important for us. Mm -hmm. um, so. You know, the narrative that the visitors are, are crashing the resources of the park is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. On the infrastructure and staffing, I think that's one of my biggest concerns there. <clears throat> you know, what are the impacts on the staff? How can we do better? Mm -hmm. Where are those gaps? Where do we want to um, focus uh, staff in different areas as we've talked about? 
Uh, and then on the visitors, I think the survey data shows they're very, very satisfied mm -hmm. with their visits. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a, a, quite a few areas in the park that we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. And we need to develop the strategies on that spect spectrum that are you know, the right things to do in the right place. Mm -hmm. uh, and then be willing to scale up as visitation goes up. And then with the gateways, you know, having the conversation and understanding what their needs are, understanding that what we do in the park affects the gateways and vice versa. And where are those areas that we can collaborate, uh, share information. We're doing a great traffic, uh, collaborative traffic study with West Yellowstone to understand mm -hmm. how their traffic flows and the timing of their lights mm -hmm. uh, can help them with the traffic backups at West Yellowstone. Uh, uh, anything else that surprised you in those numbers, Cam, as they came out of there? I mean, some, the number to me, I'll still stay on that. 70% first-time visitors to the park. We take for granted what we have right here in our backyard. Some of us use it all the time, but 70% of the people coming, and they're not bringing their kids or they don't have kids. It's adults for the first time coming to the park. Yeah, I think that's surprising to most people that I've talked to, mm -hmm. um, but I think that uh, it, 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 uh, it's a reminder that as much as we, how we've come to love this place mm -hmm. and as passionate as we are, um, you know, it, it's, it's incredible to see so many people that have never been here connect mm -hmm. uh, and become attached to it as a supporter of Yellowstone, not only in America, but around the globe. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that it's refreshing to see and uh, it's important that we keep that in mind as we're making, this, as we're making decisions mm. and understanding the viewpoints of, of different, different people and different audiences that are enjoying this park. We just have a couple minutes left here. Did the data that you got out of that, do you think that gives you, is it a good place to start? Do you think you have the information or at least we know you have more information than you have, but do you think that has the information to move forward with some of this? Did, did, is it that enlightening, this data that you're gonna be releasing here pretty soon? I think so. I mean, I, I think there's some very actionable information in there. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, we've got, you know, where, um, where visitors are perceiving no problems. And there's thousands of people that participated in the survey mm -hmm. um, where, you know, we can take staff from one area where maybe there's not as uh, many problems and put them in places where there's a lot more problems. We have better information now. Mm -hmm. um, where we want to maybe embark on more complicated, long-term strategic planning in relationship to fixing issues within the park. You know, we've got a lot of construction projects queued up. How do we, you know, I don't, I'm not looking to overdevelop Yellowstone in any way, shape, or form. We would never do that, but we can make our transportation infrastructure more conducive mm -hmm. for, for visitation, whether that's the way traffic flows, parking configurations, and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, like even Norris, it's not necessarily about more. Mm -hmm. The configuration and the way you drive in and out is really what uh, makes that place congested. So. Um, there's a lot we can derive from that, and, and the good news is it's coming from the people that are here to enjoy this place. Finally, yeah. some studies on the least studied mammal in the park, yeah. like we've talked about before. Yeah. Uh, the thing I think that just in the uh, last couple of seconds we have here is simple. Mm -hmm. That's what we're looking at. Exactly. We know. Yeah, appreciate you being here. Uh, yeah. Again, Cam Shawley, uh, Superintendent of Yellowstone National Park, joining us this morning for Face the State. Thank you very much. Look forward to digging in some of those numbers with you uh, in the future. Yeah. Thanks, Chet. You're yeah. welcome. And thank you for joining us for this edition of Face the State. You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN.